Hi, I'm Dave Stouffer, and this is JC's World. Reading is from the book, The Reverend Mr. JC, When Appearances Are Not Enough, that I wrote a couple of years ago. It's available at the Washington Public Library to check out if you'd like to read the whole thing. So far in our readings, we've seen JC change from not so good to pretty good. He's done it without his family because that was the rules laid down in the beginning. It was kind of a boot camp sort of a thing. That probably wouldn't happen in real life, but it did in the life of the Reverend Mr. J.C. And he's confided to his mentor, Pastor James, that he's feeling worse and worse about his separation from his family. Pastor James agrees. Pastor James calls J.C.'s wife, Ruth, and she's anxious to see what J.C. has been up to in Provincetown. So far, it's been shrouded in secrecy. He hasn't been allowed to tell her. As Ruth drove toward Prophetstown on the early morning of the 16th, she kept wondering, what did Reverend Edwards want her to see? What could be going on in J.C.'s life? She couldn't imagine him being any different than all the years she'd known him. He was a wonderful man, well-spoken, dressed like a million bucks. People loved him. He just didn't follow through, and he ran from any problem pulling out that rug so he wouldn't get his pants dirty and then asking forgiveness. She'd stayed with him because she loved him, because he was the father of their daughter, Jill. He was just mediocre. He just did a little of everything, but not a lot of anything. So she drove and prayed. At the Prophetstown Parsonage, Pastor James told her, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over to the church and down to the basement very quietly. There will be people there, and I don't want them to see us. Okay. Ruth's eyes widened. They quietly went down the steps and quickly stepped into a storage room. There was a small pass-through window, and James raised the partition. The basement was full of people. There were tables set up all around the room, each loaded with fruits, vegetables, baked goods, every kind of food. Ruth wondered why she was supposed to see this farmer's market. A motion at the far end of the room caught her eye. Well, there was J.C. talking to a short, stout woman who looked Italian. She couldn't believe it. He was wearing blue jeans, a work shirt, and work boots. Why does he look like that? Well, that's how we dress around here. Who's the woman? That's Mrs. Franco. She comes here for the tomatoes. She asked John to plant a particular breed of tomatoes that she uses in her sauces for her restaurant. She asked John to plant? John doesn't plant. I asked him to help me with a little garden one time, and he said he didn't like to get dirt into his fingernails. This started when John came to Prophetstown, Ruth. John and I do God's work in the community. Prophetstown has suffered since the coal mining shut down. We found a lot of people didn't have enough to eat. One night last February, John said, James, I've been looking at the big field behind the church. The idea was just to have a little vegetable garden, but he didn't get the order for seeds mailed off before he was offering space to anybody who wanted to join us. And John was so intense that the gardening space be given to anybody who wanted it. Ruth, he's got such a heart for these people. Not just Trinity Church, but the whole community. And this has been a great growing year, and people had more than they could use. And John said, not only could these people use the food, they could use a little extra income. So a week later, we held the first God's Market here in the church. It's taken off like a rocket. Not only did people bring their extra produce, but others started asking him, I'm not part of the garden. Could I still be part of God's Market? John said yes. Then there was the night of the church board meeting, James went on, as Ruth's eyes followed J.C. around the room. 
that one of the long-standing members of the church got in John's face. The church is a holy building and you're running a store in the basement. That's wrong. Besides that, I've seen people from other churches there. That's wrong. This is our church. I didn't say anything, not because I didn't care, but because I thought John needed to stand up for what he believed. Ruth snorted. He never has before. How long did it take him to exit gracefully from that board meeting? That's just it, Ruth. He stayed. He looked old Mr. Belmer straight in the eye and he said, Mr. Belmer, when was the last time you read the story in the Bible about Jesus feeding the 5,000? Belmer said, well, I've heard that all my life. Mr. Belmer, all those people had a little bit to eat in their pockets. But when they put it all together, they had lots to eat and more to feed others. We've got that garden out back, Mr. Belmer. Never seen you out there. You, you should visit. We're raising food to fill empty stomachs, and with our God's market, we're making sure everybody has access to different things people have planted and delicious baked goods. Ruth, Mr. Belmer, didn't know quite what to make about all this. So his last remark was, Well, if you're doing this in the church, you shouldn't be charging rent on all those tables. John turned to the church treasurer and said, Mr. Fredericks, I asked you to track separately what we're getting from God's market. Can you share that figure for the past month? At this point, Ruth, I said, I don't think John will mention this, so I will. John suggested everyone who has a table give 10% back to the church. Bob Fredericks said, that figure last month was $400. Mr. Belmer said, then what are we going to do with that money? John said, with the board's permission, James and I would like to put that money into a special account. So if someone in the community has a special needs, like eyeglasses or whatever, we could contribute. Belmer said, there you go again with that everybody in the community stuff. John said, everybody in the community is contributing to the garden and the market. Jesus didn't say we should just love everybody in our congregation. He said we should love our neighbor. Belmer just grunted. I suppose. But how do you figure out 10% of tomatoes? And Ruth, that's when John came up with his other idea. Look over there in the kitchen. You see those women working? Today they're canning tomatoes. The money received is split up among those who are working. And Mrs. Franco is so happy to have the tomatoes she remembers having years ago. John didn't want to see anything being thrown away, so he went to a couple of women in the church who knew about canning and preserving food. He asked if they would mind sharing their knowledge. Now we have a core group of about 10 to 15 who are using those big gas ranges that were just going unused for years. What happens to the canned and preserved produce? Ruth asked. James gestured, look around you, Ruth. Ruth saw floor-to-ceiling shelves around three walls plus a couple of rows in the center of the storage room filled with jars of beans, tomatoes, all the goodness that a garden can produce. My word, you have a small fortune in jars in here. In all the years John spent playing golf and not doing much of anything, he did meet a lot of people. He knew a man back in Pine Grove who got him jars, lids, ceiling rings, almost for free. So we take some of the God's market income and we buy supplies. John is doing this. You're not doing it and giving him credit. Oh, I help out, but it's John's project. There are already plans for next year. The two garden spots have become an oasis of sorts. In the evenings and on Saturdays and Sunday afternoons, those who have strips of land in the gardens gather. Most take pride in the way their patch looks. It's become a place just to bring lawn chairs. That started when John built me a lawn chair to take out there. Ruth's mouth opened, but no words came out. James continued. Then somebody got inspired to build some picnic tables. Every few evenings there's a little bonfire going. I tell you, Ruth, it's been a good thing for the community. It's given people something to take pride in, somewhere they can go to see their neighbors. People are smiling and greeting each other on the streets. It's a good thing. And it's been a really good thing for John. How do you mean, good for John? 
Ruth, I'm not a very good preacher, and John always has, so I understand, had a gift for words and theatrics, and has been considered a pretty good preacher. Well, that's right, but he didn't practice what he preached. Well, that's how this garden and market and the canning project did good for John. He was digging the ground in the spring and saving fishing worms for guys to use. He was hoeing. He was arranging for jars. He was lining up people to work. Ruth looked at James and said, I want to believe you, James, but I need to see something first. Does J.C. have an office here in the church? Yes, he does. Can I see it? Sure. She stepped into what was obviously meant to be an office. There was a desk, but it was pushed into a corner. There were sheets of plywood tacked to the walls, covering the bookcases, covered with sheets of newsprint paper. Ruth realized she was looking at maps of the two garden plots, with names written beside each plot. So that's how he remembers who's farming what piece? Yep. Another sheet of paper listed what everyone was growing. What's this for? James said, after this got so big, John realized that not everyone needed to grow tomatoes or corn. They could specialize and everybody could share. So he's gotten people to agree that next year they'll each plant certain things. Next year? Ruth said, you're kidding. No, I'm not. The soft, comfortable chair behind the desk was dusty. No one had sat in that chair or dusted the room for a long time. She couldn't believe anyone had spent time in that room. She said as much to James. Oh, he's hardly ever in here, he answered. He's different, Ruth. He's not the same John Charles Wesley that he was a year and a half ago. And I realize that might be a little tough for you to believe, but give him a chance. You don't know this, but when he's getting ready to come see you, he will spend 20 minutes getting the dirt out from under his fingernails going to the back of the closet to pull out those clothes he used to be so proud of, because that's what he thinks you expect. He thinks you'd be embarrassed to see him the way he looks most days here. Oh, he's still clean and his hair is combed, but he might have paint on his dungarees and certainly dirty hands most days. Ruth looked at James with wondering eyes and said very softly, James, this is so much to take in, so different. So unlike the J.C. that I've been married to. I hope you'll understand, but I need to go. I can't see him right now. I need to put some distance between us so I can think and pray about this. So I can... How do I know this wasn't all staged just for me? There are, there are so many questions. I can't see J.C. right now. I just can't. Of course, Ruth thinks and prays hard about her marriage and whether she can trust this new J.C. But it isn't long before she calls Pastor James to ask if she can come to Prophetstown to see J.C. Should I call him, let him know I'm coming, or will you let him know? Ruth felt as nervous as a schoolgirl on her first date. James said, you just pack your bag and I'd put in some work clothes if I were you and come over on the 14th. And if you don't mind a suggestion, Play it by ear. Thank you, James. I'm really nervous about this. Ruth, I'll tell you what I tell John. Don't let it be your problem. Let it be God's problem. You pray about it. I'll pray about it. We'll just turn it over to God. I'll see you in about two weeks. As Ruth hung up the phone, she was surprised by how many conflicting emotions she felt. She was scared. She was excited. She was angry. She wanted to go. She didn't want to go. She wanted to call and tell J.C. she was coming. She wanted to sneak up on him. An hour or so later, she heard the front door slam and knew Jill was home. She opened her door and called, Jill, we need to talk about something just between us girls. The second Jill appeared, Ruth blurted, I'm going to go visit your dad. I'll be gone several days, I, th I think. Oh, Mom, that's great. Then Jill's face turned wistful. I wished I could see him, too. I think it would be best if I went alone this time, sweetheart. Ruth pulled her into a hug. This will be the first time your dad and I have been together more than a couple of hours at a time since he went to Provincetown. Could be awkward. 
there could be a confrontation and even a showdown. It would be better if I tested the water first. If things go the way I hope, you'll be seeing your daddy soon. Jill's pout was replaced by a little smile. Do you think there's going to be a hanky-panky, don't you? Jill, quit that. Her obvious embarrassment made Jill laugh. Jill squeezed her mother tightly, laughed again, then headed for the door. Have a good time, Mom. I'll expect a full report when you get home. I mean a full report. Ruth could hear her laughter floating down the hall. The next week and a half went by in a giddy whirl. The suitcase was packed and unpacked 16 times. Each day, Ruth would go through it again. Ruth was 37, but that week and a half, she felt younger than her daughter. She prayed, she thought, mentally playing out scenarios that might happen. On Friday morning, when she swung that suitcase into the car, she was wound as tightly as any spring ever was wound. Her dad stood by the driver's side and opened the door. Your mom and I will take good care of Jill, and we're praying for you, so don't worry about anything. Just have fun. Have fun? From what she had seen of J.C. in the church basement, she thought she'd be confronting a stranger. Have fun? She didn't even know what to say to him. Near Prophetstown, she saw a roadside stop with a picnic table, a few trees. She pulled off. She bowed her head. You and I will never know what she prayed. But as Ruth sat at the picnic table, feeling the warmth of the sun, she felt peaceful. All the imagined scenarios were replaced by a feeling of certainty. She was certain J.C. had changed, but she was also certain that he couldn't have changed so completely that he would not resemble the man she married, and she was certain that she would be entering a different world. James had given her the address. As she drove slowly down Harrison Street, she didn't see J.C., but she saw a ladder propped against the unpainted portion of the house with a paint bucket hanging from one rung. She had never gone through a fence gate that didn't squeak. This one was no exception. By the time she reached the porch steps, she heard steps coming toward the screen door. She heard her husband's voice. Be there in just a minute. And then he was at the door. The flimsy screen door stood like a bank vault door between them. Ruth was speechless. J.C. was holding a tall glass and was dressed in jeans and a white t-shirt, both with paint smears on him. Ruth's first thought was, he looks younger. Whatever he's doing agrees with him. J.C. broke the silence. Hello, Ruth. This is a surprise. Can you come in for a minute? I've got more of this iced tea in the kitchen. Well, yeah, uh, I guess. Uh, thank you. J.C. pushed the screen door open and Ruth was very careful. In fact, it seemed both were very careful not to come within touching distance of each other. J.C. gestured to the back of the house. They both walked to the kitchen. He poured her some tea. I bought some cookies at the farmer's market. Would you like one? He put several on a small plate and said, I have to work pretty hard at not making a pig out of myself with these. Don't want to get that middle-aged spread. Ruth's heart raced as she realized that the soft belly he had accumulated while sitting for years in his office had disappeared. His shoulders seemed square. His arms and head had color, as if he'd spent a lot of time outside. They sat at the table together drinking tea, neither knowing how to start, what to say. Finally, Ruth said, You look different. Oh, it's these work clothes. I can go change if you'd like. I didn't know you were coming or I would have cleaned up. No, no, no. I, I like the way you look. It's just that well, I'm not used to seeing you in work clothes and paint smears in it. It just takes a bit of getting used to. You look good, J.C. So do you, Ruth. I've missed being able to look at you. After that, the words just seemed to tumble out of both of them. And sometime during the conversation, they moved to the little table on the deck. And a little while later, J.C. remembered the open can of paint he'd left outside. And Ruth went with him to the garage while he put the lid on and cleaned the brush. In the tumble of words, J.C. and Ruth were both able to say and hear what was necessary for J.C. to realize that Ruth still loved him 
and for Ruth to become aware that this was not the old J.C., but a new and improved version. J.C. talked about his early days in Prophetstown, buying the work clothes, the early mornings, late nights, the humiliation of not being in the pulpit, all the people, all the houses. And as J.C. told his story, Ruth realized how gradual the change had been, and how skillfully James Edwards had reshaped the man she loved into the man who stood before her. J.C. asked, Can you stay for lunch? Ruth thought it was wise not to say yet that she'd come prepared to stay for three days. Yes, I can stay for lunch. Somewhere in the course of the afternoon, as they were sitting in the porch swing tied to the oak tree, Ruth told J.C. of her trip to Prophetstown a few weeks ago, and how she watched him from the storeroom of the church, Fellowship Hall. She confessed to sneaking down the back steps with James and then demanding to see J.C.'s office. J.C. laughed. I knew someone was in the storage room, but I was too busy to come see who it was. So that was you. Yes, that was me. I apologize for spying on you. Ruth, you can ask me anything you want. For the first time in our lives together, my life is an open book to you. J.C., I think I've seen and heard about all I can hold for one day. Can you show me around Prophet of Town a little? Sure I can, Ruth. Can you stay for supper? There's this really neat Italian restaurant if you're not worried about getting back too late. Ruth looked at J.C. James Edwards knows I'm here. In fact, when I said I wanted to see you, he suggested this weekend at this place. Well, that sneaky rascal. And, and I can not only stay for supper, but I can stay through Sunday if you want me to. I'm, um, sleeping in one of the kids' rooms. It was made into a guest room. And you can stay in Mrs. Purcell's room. We could talk. That would be great. I really need to spend some of the time painting, though. I'm running out of time for that project, but we could talk while I paint. I can show you around Provincetown, too, and I wouldn't expect anything in terms of, of intimacy. It's been kind of a long time. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, John. Now, can you show me where to put my suitcase? I'll do better than that. J.C. stood and walked quickly to the car for the suitcase. Ruth listened to his footsteps as he stepped into the house and delivered the suitcase to the downstairs bedroom. He was whistling. She had never heard him whistle. Her heart was strangely warm. It looks like J.C.'s marriage is returning to an even keel and perhaps growing to a new level of love. And the people of Prophetstown love J.C. for all the love he has to show them. What could go wrong? Maybe nothing. Please join me again for another peek inside J.C.'s world. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Dave Stouffer.